All right, brothers. Uh, so today, our brother senior deacon Javon Greenaway is going to be sharing uh, B symbolism, ancient mysteries, uh, and uh, Freemasonry is going to be his education, his lecture for uh, this uh, this evening. So please give me attention. We will open it up at the end for questions and answers. So I ask that any questions that you do have, uh, please just write them down and, and hang tight. We'll get through uh, this presentation and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, brother senior deacon. The floor is yours. Okay. All right. Good evening, brothers. Um, okay, I'm going to give you a brief presentation on the beast symbolism and how it relates to the ancient mysteries and Freemasonry. Um, the thoughts and opinions in this presentation does not reflect the thoughts and opinions of the Grand Lodge of State of New York, Prince Hall Mason, or St. James Lodge under that jurisdiction. This is solely the thoughts and opinions based on my research um, that I'm responsible for. And with that said, let us go ahead and start. So right now we have here. The earliest mentions of the bee and the beehive in Freemasonry um, was said to have been in Ireland and uh, one of the earliest Masonic cataclysms around 1724. Now the earliest manuscript, manuscript was titled um, A Letter from the Grand Mistress of Female, Female Freemasons to Mr. Harding, the printer found at the Halley Day Collection in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. And in that manuscript i'm just going to read a little bit of what it uh says as it applies to um my presentation and it starts uh a bee has in all ages and nations been the grand hieroglyphic of freemasonry because it excels all other creatures in the controversy of commodityness of its habitation or comb nay masonry or building seems to be of the very essence or nature of the bee for her building not the ordinary way of all other living creatures mm -hmm. is the gener generative cause which produces the young ones for this reason the kings of france both pagan and christian always eminent freemasons carried three bees for their arms and when I say arms, I mean for their coat of arms, not literally their arms on their body. Um, what modern Masons call a lodge for the above reasons by in quick antiquity called a hive of Freemasons. And for the same reason, when dissension happens in a lodge, the going off and forming another lodge to this day is called swarming. Okay, so this is what the uh, manuscript says in relation to uh, the early uh, mention of the beehive. And it was attributed to John Swift because after 1724, between 1724 and 1727 is when his pamphlet probably was being circulated around. Um, and that's why his name is also attached to uh, one of the earliest mentions of the beehive in, in Freemasonry. Now, one of the earliest definitions of the beehive as it relates to the third degree master mason is the beehive is an emblem of industry and recommends the practice of that virtue to all beings from the highest self in heaven to the lowest reptile of the dust. It teaches us that we that as we come into the world of, ration, of rational and intelligent beings, so we should ever be industrious ones, never sitting down contended while our fellow creatures around us are in want, especially when it, when it is in our power to relieve them without inconvenience of ourselves. Okay, so that is what they had to say in the early ritual about what the meaning of the beehive meant. Um, so 
now we're going to take a look at what it mean, meant in the ancient world, starting with ancient Egypt. Um, so in ancient Egypt, the B was also a title of royalty or sovereignty. So as you can see here in the uh, hieroglyphics, you can see um, that right there, the, the B was also a symbol of the king of lower Egypt. And that um, it also meant like a beekeeper, which beekeeping was a very prominent um, undertaking in ancient Egypt. I mean, it covered all facets of, of um, their life. You know, uh, beekeeping was, I mean, used for industry, commerce, ritual, and everything. I mean, just about everything. The bee symbolism, symbolism and honey also. Ritually, um, it was every day in the temple of Amun-Ra, there was a ritual performed called the opening of the mouth ritual. And with that ritual, it was to symbolize um, the becoming of a god or a king. And what they would do is they would take honey and they would pour it on a statue of a god. And that was supposed to be, that was supposed to be a process of making that god divine. So this is the high regard they had for honey and the symbolism of the bee. Um, in one of the chapters of the uh, ritual called the chapter of Festal perfume in the form of honey, it says, Hail Amun-Ra, Lord of the throne of two lands. Because the bee, not only did it mean uh, the king of lower Egypt, but later on in ancient Egyptian society, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt came together as one land, and the, the pharaoh, the king at that time, was known as the King Bee. So he was the highest office, and the bee was his symbol um, in that in that culture and in that society. It, it, you know, it was the title of the king. They identified as the king, the beekeeper, the king bee, and the way they come about in terms of what the origin of the bee is, they say that the origin of the bee is from the tears of Ra. So Ra being the sun god, um, his tears came, fell to the earth, and while falling to the earth, it created the bee. <clears throat> so in that time, as I witnessed, is to the meaning of the bee was um, a Greek and Latin uh, writers in the fourth century. Uh, they both um, were like eyewitnesses to say, yes, this is what the title of the, the B meant. Um, so we're gonna move on to the Mediterranean cultures, <clears throat> particularly Greece. Um, in Greece now, the B was also prominent and beekeeping was also prominent. And a lot of the gods were known as uh be be kings also um and also their goddesses also their mother goddesses were also known as be what you're seeing here is a picture of Ar artemis um also known as diana um she's she was identified with the b also and she um has her own mythology um that is associated with her and she is closely related with the uh, Eleusian mysteries. And um, in those mysteries, you're taught certain uh, things such as regeneration, um, death, rebirth, all of that is included in their mysteries, um, in the Eleusian mysteries. <clears throat> so in ancient Grecian culture, the B symbolized divine concepts of life and death, the initiatic, death and rebirth was that of personal regeneration and transformation. Um, so I know that it, that sounds very similar to what we go through in Freemasonry, the initiatic experience, the uh, symbolic death of Hiram Beth, the rebirth of 
you know, you becoming a new person, you know, <clears throat> because you have now gone through an initiation. Um, so that's a correlation in between the third degree and how it was looked at um, in ancient times through process of initiation, such as the Eleusian Mysteries. <clears throat> So the Eleusian Mysteries were like an initi uh, initiatory tradition where the initiates were called the Mystai. They were to learn about the mysteries of rebirth. Um, they were also supposed to learn about immortality, which was um, also supposed to be part of the process of removing the fear of death as a bad thing, right? So when we think about that Masonically, we could think about um, making good men better right? And part of that making good men better would also be part of, you know, removing fear, right? Because fear can be crippling. So this was um, in some ways reflective of some of the initiation rites that we may go through within our own initiatic experience in the third degree of Master Mason. There is a, a myth that um, takes place in ancient Greece that includes a uh, priestess Diomeder. Um, and the myth comes from Corinth. It's a town in, in ancient Greece. Now, um, there's a whole backstory about Demeter and Persephone and Hades and, and Zeus. It's really long. Um, I don't wanna take up your time, but let me just give you a quick rundown. So Demeter is the daughter of Zeus and Rhea. Rhea is the mother. Um, one day, uh, Hades wants to, he wants to get married to uh, that meter, and Zeus agreed. So they agreed that they were going to, you know, get married. One day, Demeter is out in the field, <clears throat> and um, Hades comes because he's the god of the underworld. He comes from the underworld. He snatches her up out of the field and takes her down into the underworld. Now, her mother, Rhea, was looking for her and she couldn't find her. Well, she came to find out that Zeus made a deal with Hades without her knowing about the, what was gonna happen with her daughter. Um, so she went frantically looking for her, couldn't find her because now she's in the underworld with, uh, with Hades. Um, Zeus made a deal with Hades to release her and shortly after he released her, but what he did is I think he fed her um, a portion of like a honey flavored uh, pomegranate and that was to keep her, she was going to eat this, but it was symbolically was going to keep her tied to the underworld um, even though she would leave, eventually leave. So her being in the underworld was a way of how we look at it in terms of the death of the season. So the winter months were um, associated with her being in the underworld because specifically she is known as the goddess of um, plenty and, and fertility and growth. So, you know, if there is no, you know, if there's no goddess there to make the plea for the plants or the flowers to grow or anything or any nature, uh, that's what happens, and that's what we see manifest in the winter months. So there, uh, so that story is based around the seasons in the winter months. Um, you know, kind of like the dying of the sun. You know, for three days in the winter and all that for three months. <clears throat> so that myth, uh, that that's a a brief identification of who Diomeda is. Now, in the myth with and from Corinth, she is uh, the 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 priestess um, of Diomeda, right, the goddess, they are called Melissa or Melissina, right? Melissina in Greek means bee, right? So the initiates are literally, they're called the bee. Um, so an elder priestess of Diomeda is, she's initiated into, these, into this initiatic uh, cult of Diomeda by Diomeda herself. And she's going about the town walking, you know, and she's approached by some women in the town, in this Greek, Greek town of Corinth. 
and they pressed her about the secrets. They wanted to know, okay, what are the secrets? What are the secrets of uh, the, 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 the mysteries of Diomeda? And she refused to tell. She would not tell them. They got infuriated and they killed her. They tore her into pieces. So um, when the news got back to uh, Diomeda, she was so upset that she punished the women with um, like plagues, plagues of pestilence. And um, she, she, she like eventually she just like they died off, you know, they killed her and her body, the body of um, Melissa, she turned them into bees and her body just, you know, burst into bees. And um, at that time, bees was definitely in Greece symbolized by the soul. So it was the soul going from the body at that time when she, she got upset and, and, the, and found the, body, the dead body of Melissa, her body turned into bees and that symbolized the soul going off. <clears throat> So uh, Masonically, what I see there is, again, we can look at Hiram Abiff and the three ruffians wanting the secrets of a master mason and him not wanting to uh, tell those secrets to the unworthy. And what did they do? We know that he eventually lost his life, uh, you know, by him just refusing to uh, turn over the secrets, you know, and him rather dying an honorable death than to turn over the secrets. Um, so right there in these ancient mysteries of Diameter, um, we see that the um, same thing is happening in, in our third degree of Freemasonry with the three ruffians and, and, and the death of um, Heimer Beth. So, the Mistai, you know, in this, you know, in, in all of this, the initiates um, of the Elysian, they're, they're taught rebirth and immortality. And, and this is something that, um, you know, we understand as the, you know, rebirth, the death of, you know, our, our former selves and coming into a new being, the immortality of the soul and everything. <clears throat> all of that has a correlation between what we practice today and craft masonry versus everything that has happened already in ancient history. And the idea of um, making good men better, you know, that all correlates with, you know, freedom of death, you know, being fearless and, you know, actually building yourself up. Now, one of the, um, one of the fifth century Greeks, um, Greek writers, what he had to say about the Lucian mysteries were that the sacred mysteries which hold the human race together, okay, that's what he thought about the Lucian mysteries were that they were going to hold the human race together. So um, everything that they learned was going to be for the betterment of humanity, which I see as something also correlating in the term when we say um, the brotherhood of man, right? So, you know, um, everything that we're learning, you know, how we carry ourselves, you know, and, and all the process that we go through in masonry is to uh, make, make, make us better. And, and with that, we would um, agree with, you know, our fellow brethren, you know, the brotherhood of mankind, you know, and we'll walk in the world, you know, more of a upright man and, and um, loving individual. <clears throat> so the beehive and the symbolism in the lodge. Okay, so the Prestonian lecture, right, uh, as it pertains to what what it is, what he what he had in mind when he defined the uh, the beehive. What he had to say about it was that so he that I'm going to read a quote from the Prestonian ritual, paraphrasing it. He that will demean himself as to not endeavor to add to the common stock of knowledge and understanding 
may be deemed a drone in the hive of nature, a useless member of society and unworthy of our protection as masons. Um, so there again, we have a quote about what uh, the beehive means um, and how it supposed to reflect on us as masons um, here you know, in the world as we move about and how we are supposed to constantly um, be adding on to our knowledge, you know, knowledge of ourselves, knowledge of our surroundings and, and, and everything um, that is for our learning opportunity. And, and clear here, he says, the drone, you know, would be deemed useless for us, right? So, you know, where, you know, if brothers are not, you know, doing what they're supposed to, you know, in terms of lot, you know, adding on something, whether it's manual labor, whether it's bringing forth light, or you know, however you contribute to the to the to the um craft, in your lodging particularly, um, if you're not doing it, you're not worthy of our protection, you know. <clears throat> so, again, here we are, you know coming to the uh, idea of the, the greater symbolism of what the bee and the beehive mean. Now, something um, I found very interesting when I was doing my research was the, uh, how, how the beehive is used in, in other lodges, right? So when I was doing my research, I came across um, in a theosophical lodge, what the symbolism of the bee is and the beehive. And so in theosophical lodges, the beehive represents a more subtle structure in their ritual work. Uh, it is remembered that in this process of sensing the lodge, a beehive shaped structure was erected in front of the pedestal of each of the principal offices. At certain times, the candidate was placed within the bottle structures so that it was thought that she may absorb the subtle influence of influences invoked by the rites. So here in the Theosophical Lodges, they take the, the symbolism of the beehive and the, and the bee a lot more spiritual in nature in terms of, you know, the the the, the uh, what they're trying to relay in terms of you know a pedestal being in front of the three principals' offices and you know what he or she may absorb as in terms of the rights. Um, so that's um, them working, I guess, operatively in some sense of of the enacting of the ritual. You know, actually, you know, put, putting the the candidate within the beehive you know, to get more of a feel of what, what that process is supposed to be like. You know. um, also, what I found in um, Zizi Zang, his, um, in his book, Ancient Mysteries, uh, he says that the hive um, denotes man's physical body and the honeycomb signifies that which is interior to the physical, the astral body. And the honey is symbolic of the spiritual body, which is composed of the choosiest nectars and aromas of earthly experience. <clears throat> and that's C.C. Zane in his book, Ancient Masonry. So again, we have uh, another look at what the beehive and the bee means on a spiritual level. Um, how honey, again, is symbolic, you know, and and it in here it's related to the spiritual body, you know, and 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 the and the, the honey and the honey the hive itself is um, representative of the physical body, you know. Um, so that's just another interesting thing that came across me when I was looking um, and doing this research. Um, so what is it that we need to know and remember about the beehive and the symbolism? Well. <clears throat> what we need to remember is that, you know, for the early Masons and even in, in, in nature, 
the beehive has has symbolized that um, cooperation, hard work, and independence are what sustain a society or, or a society or or, or or a group undertaking. So when we when we start thinking about what our jobs are in the lodge and even without the lodge, it's always to be in 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 uh, working together to get a goal accomplished. So the, the bee goes about, he takes his orders in a very structured way. Everybody has their place in the hive. Every, everybody plays a role. Um, and they all have this different position. There are different bees that do different things. There are literally a bees called mason bees that just do the building. There are bees that uh, are specifically there to guard the, the door and the beehive, right? Um, so, you know, there's no, there's no energy wasted in a beehive whatsoever. There's, and if there's a drone bee, it's, it gets killed. Just simply put, they kill it because it's, it has no point in being in that kind of communal society where there's much work to be done and it's gonna need everybody's hand, um, hands on and knowledge also to uh, get the task done. Um, so um, the beat also is um, looked at as, when you think of the bee, the, one of the first things you see is, I don't know, especially if you're around, you know, women, they, they, they jump and they run, right? So it's this fear of the unknown, right? But what it, does the bee ever bother you? No, a bee would never come and bother you unless it was threatened, right? So it's the same way how, you know, um, people who don't know about masonry, right? We kind of get a bad rap. You know, for whatever reason, you know, they associate us with evil and devil worship and stuff like that. But um, they will they will never say a mason did something to me, right? Just like how a bee would never do anything to an individual unless it was threatened, right? But that's just, just to go to show you uh, the fear of the unknown. But if the bee was to vanish off the face of the earth, uh, we'd have about four years before civilization would be done, right? So when we start thinking about what our role is in our homes and in our communities, if men that are going through an initiatic experience, trying to better themselves through rebirth, learning about the soul and being fearless and, you know, striving to be better men, you know, if these kind of individuals with this kind of stature and this learning process, if they remove themselves from the community, then I would hate to see what that community begins to look like inside and outside of homes, right? Um, so again, there's an, this is just another correlation of how important it is to um, identify with the bee, you know? And even though it's a very lost symbol, you know, within masonry, um, especially since the uh, Union of the Grand Lodge back in 1813, prior to that, the bee was very much a prominent symbol. Um, but it's also in other cultures, it's also associated with um, love also. Like in the Hindu culture, there are different Hindu god and goddesses that are associated with it. Um, you know, to be being, uh, you know, one of good luck. Shiva is one where it means good luck, transformation, and peace. Um, uh, Krishna, it also represents reincarnation. Again, there's that re resurrection and immortality of the soul theme going throughout ancient um, uh, mythology and, and whatnot. So, <clears throat> again, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very important that we understand that every time we look at that symbol, it's, it's a call to us to uh, be, do something great, do something great ceaselessly, uh, tirelessly, and do it you know, to the best of your ability and never ceasing, you know, the work always has to get done and to look back at the beauty of the work that is done because you have to be in awe 
when you start thinking about, you know, what the work of the bee is and how it builds its hive, you know, um, just, you know, very amazing. And I could go on and on in how to be in sacred geometry and a whole bunch of, you know, how the beehive is set out sacred geometry wise and everything. But, you know, um, that's probably part two of another discussion. Yeah, but that would just, be, you know, that would know that, just to know that, um, you know, the bee is, is you know, a, a very important symbol for us as Masons and as men um, in our community in terms of getting things done. And, and it always was a prominent symbol um, of sovereignty, independence, and, and life giving. Um, and, that. and that's, that's pretty much my presentation. Brother C. Deacon, thank you very much, man. Appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you sharing your thoughts uh, on this today. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with one question really quickly, and then we'll open it up to questions for the rest. I believe in your seventh slide, you touched on the symbolism, uh, and then you tied it into uh, ancient Egyptians and then ancient Greek. Um, and I might, I might be off on the slide. It might have been the slide prior to that. But uh, either way, you tied it into both of those, and then you kind of touched on some of the religions that, that coincide with some of the similar thoughts. Uh, in regards to those religions, with the beehive and also with just overall ma like Masonic you know, uh, actions and teachings, uh, how else and what other religions do you see that have tied in outside of just uh, ancient Egyptians and ancient Greek? Like what other religions tie into kind of like those similar thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, I touched, I, I kind of just touched on that. There is, in Hinduism, um, the bee is very prominent also. Um, you know, she it, there is an iconoglyph of Shiva, it being a bee on top of a triangle, which is um, supposed to be a depiction of Shiva. Um, also, the the god the god Indra is also associated with the bee. Um, uh, there's another goddess. I can't say her name properly. Um, but spell it. Uh, hold on, let me see. So you don't have to, you don't have to go too deep on it. I was just asking more, just in regards to to the, mul the the multiple amounts of religions that actually tie into like similar thoughts or similar actions. So I think we've just yeah, it's so it, yeah, Hinduism. Hinduism is definitely one. Um, is I don't think there's a lot in Hebrew in terms of. Judaism, there was there's not a lot in Judaism, but um, definitely, you know, I think the most principal that you would find would be in, in um, Hinduism. I appreciate that, Brother C. Deacon. All right, uh, brothers, I have unmute, I unmuted everybody here on this line. So any questions uh, for Brother C. Deacon on his presentation for today? Yeah, Brother um, C. Deacon, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead bro. Okay, what inspired you to actually look this up? Because this is very intriguing stuff, to be honest with you. I mean, I knew about the work of B in Freemason, how we elude ourselves. And what made you? Okay, so um, there was a book I had gotten a couple of years ago. Uh, it, was, it was it was like Freemasonry, uh, um, talking about Tink uh, Tutankhamun. And it also was trying to um, make a case that uh, the ancient Egyptians and even ancient Mesoamericans, they had used um, the bee and the sun were prominent in their um, cultures. And that, I mean, it revolved around, you know, the sun was this big thing and the, and the bee was also had this little role to play in it. So I read that book. Right. And it was very interesting. I actually didn't finish it, but I read enough to say, okay, so let me look into this B symbolism, um, especially in, in, in Freemasonry, because I know, I think to me, the um, meaning that we have in the ritual is very exoteric. Um, I think how you look at it in terms of what I tried to explain in ancient Greece, particularly in those ancient mysteries of the esoteric, when we're talking about the soul generation and everything, we don't talk about that in the beehive symbolism in our ritual. 
is just basically explained to us as being very industrious. So I definitely wanted to be able to find an esoteric interpretation to it. And I was able to do it, you know, with a little bit of I, mean, I, I, I had to condense it down. Like it's so much um, with the bee and the beehive, especially right there in ancient Greece. And not only that, there's a whole book, there's like three or four books talking about the beekeeping and the beehive and the bee in ancient Egypt. So, I mean, I tried my best to break it down into like 15, 10 minutes, but it's something I could go on and on and on about. Um, Javon, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. at, what, at what point in, in masonry, you said that it, there was something that goes back to the 19th century in regards to like the definition of how it's used in masonry, but at what point did they start using the actual B for symbolism in Masonic culture? Uh, so like in, in prior to the union of the Grand Lodge, it was, they used it a lot. Um, you know, I, you know, probably like in Ireland and Scotland and stuff like that. Um, it was on lodge doors. It was on certificates of, um, of Masons, Master Masons. It's on aprons. It was very prominent on aprons. Um, it was all over. It, it was just, it was all over in, in Ireland and like Scotland. And as soon as the union of the um, Grand Lodge is in 1813, um, pre-union Grand Lodge, you know, it was a lot. And after that, they just dropped it. For whatever reason, it just stopped. They just stopped letting the B be like this very prominent Masonic symbol. Um, and that's why um, Dr. Harrison, um, <coughs> He uh he has um a website talking about um I think it's Dave Harrison. He has a website talking about the lost symbols of Masonry, and the B was one of them. And he doesn't go as deep as I did. He just vaguely mentions, you know, that you know it's in Mithras rites, and this is where it was in terms of Masonry pre-union. He doesn't really go into ancient mysteries, you know. And even in my like research no one has really kind of took it there there they briefly mentioned it but um yeah you know it was they, they, like after the grand the united the grand lodges they just dropped it for whatever reason there's no one knows why but they just dropped it it just stopped being a prominent you know emblem Good job, bro. brothers any other any other questions for brother c deacon all right if you have any other questions, I ask you to please uh, make sure that you uh, you reach right out to him, or you even send it out into our James uh, Brothers chat group. Uh, and you know, every any question anyone has, I'm sure a lot of us are probably thinking the same. or could use the education and knowledge. 